Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the CSBI podcast. I'm here with my friend uh, Razib Khan. Razib, how are you doing today? Yeah, it's been a pretty good day. Uh, recording podcasts, editing, you know, doing genetic stuff that I don't talk about in public because I'm a contractor and consultant, you know, usual. Uh-huh. So you are not only a public intellectual, but you have, I guess that's what I was going to ask you. Uh, how do you describe your job if you run into someone in an elevator and they say, what do you do, Mr. Razib? What do you say? Uh, I usually say I'm a geneticist, and then if they ask in more detail, I explain like direct-to-consumer genetics and 23andMe and things like that. Um, because uh, what I do on the internet is like that's internet Razib, and uh, I don't want to um, have to get into everything. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And so how would you describe your, uh, like if someone knew what a Substack was and they asked, what's your Substack about? How, how do you describe it? Because it's really one of a kind. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have yet to meet a geneticist uh, in my life who knows as much history as me. Uh-huh. And so I have basically parlayed that into uh, yeah, a consulting career privately. I, I do certain things that you don't necessarily always know about. Um, but, but also, like on the Substack, what I try to do is I try to reinterpret, um, not just reinterpret, but to explain history with what we know from genetics. Because, uh, so for example, uh, Richard, you are a uh, Levantine Christian Arab. And if you ask mm-hmm. about your heritage, I could actually tell you in quite explicit detail genetically because we have so much information and so much data. And I myself even have that data. I actually have your data specifically, right. but uh, I have like so <laughs> much data on so many ethnic groups that I can tell you all of these things. And I just feel like people should know because they ask as if we don't know, but we do know, you know, like, I mean, I can tell you that like if someone says, well, you know, Russians are basically Tatars on their skin. Yeah. You know, I, I can tell them, well, actually they're only about 10% Tatar. That's the median. And about 50% of them have 0% Tatar. Like I can tell you like for a fact, that's true, you know? Right. And you can, you can refute like the nation of Islam, Right. Um, well, actually, um, there are certain things we shouldn't be talking about because these are deep uh, truths about the origins of the white race, and uh, you know, Farrakhan You're will come out. Yeah, like like the, the, it's called. We call it um, the 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 Yakub modal haplotype. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, it's a haplotype. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> okay, that, that 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 part is not okay. Our fact checkers say that's that's not true. Uh, but yeah, there. This is very. I mean, it's very cool because I. Uh, you know, like I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm in political science, international relations. And when I read, you know, I read uh, my, uh, you know, I read your Substack, obviously, but uh, the other, the only, you know, I've read some uh, evolutionary psych stuff, but I, the, the book that really influenced me was uh, David Reich's uh, uh, Who We Are. Uh, I just found that absolutely fascinating when that came out. And it made me sort of jealous because uh, I'm in political science, right? Or that's that's my background. And you say, what do we know that we didn't know 10, 20 years ago? A lot of times, what we like, what was written 20 years ago or 50 years ago, 100 years ago, actually, I, I find more insightful because you know, sort of political correctness has taken over, and you know, this uh, sort of a uh, super specialization and this very using complex methods just for the sake of using complex methods. I think there's a lot of pathologies uh, in political science, for example, and other social science sciences. So, are we better off than we were 20, 10, 20 years ago? It's it's at least disputable. Uh, well, this is this is science. This is something you can look back. Look, there's stuff we know today we didn't know in 2015, which we didn't know in 2010. Uh, we didn't know in 2000. Is that part of the appeal to you that this is like uh-huh. this is history, but it's like real science? I mean, yeah, you, you know more. It, it progresses. Well, this is not this is this is not going to continue forever. I mean, it's it, basically um, so. One thing that I would say is the methods are complex uh, in in a lot of ways that we have. But I can also just plot a principal component analysis. Yeah. And that's easy for people to understand. So for the listeners who don't know what it is, you know, it takes genetic variation or any variation, uh, multiple multiple variables, like you look at a bunch of columns and a bunch of rows. It takes all that variation, and it's uh, basically a, a way to decompose the variation into multiple dimensional units. And when you do a principal component analysis of human populations, you get two dimensions and you get this like kind of like V shape, uh, this like flying wing. It looks like a, a B2 bomber or something. And it's basically like the first principal component separates Africans from non-Africans. The second principal component separates East from West Eurasians. And then there's some other odd groups that you can explore through the principal components. But it's basically showing you the variation in the genetic data and how it's clustering uh, across individuals. And what naturally happens is people cluster with their own ethnic group. So for example, um, 
when, uh, let's say you're Pakistani and you say, well, actually, we have nothing genetically to do with Indians. And I'll just be like, well, look at this principal component map. You're landing right on top of the Indians. How is that happening? And then they'll usually be like, well, I don't understand the science. And I'm just like, well, look at your face. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> right. you know, yeah. so I mean, like, there's point. other there's other avenues of confirmation. I'm like, it's not coincidental that you have an Indian face and not an Arab face. And they'll be like, well, okay, you're making a good point, you know? Yeah. So usually people begrudgingly will acknowledge that. If they're not like, it's not like I'm showing them a regression and I'm going to have to tell them what a beta is. And, you know, are, they're not going to ask, like, well, maybe there's like multiple collinearities. In the, you know what I'm saying? That we don't need yeah, to go into like the, spatial, spatial distances. Exactly. It's sort of an easy. Now, yeah. It is. And it's easy. There's a surface level understanding that you can give to regular people. There's a deeper level of analysis that you can find in the papers and that I try to unpack. But that's not necessary to understand that. Um, you know, th- it, this is related to what you were saying about political science, where, you know, 100 years ago, uh, people in biology believed that human populations varied and that they were different and that mm. they clustered with each other. And then there yeah. was a period like, you know, starting, say, in the 70s and 80s, when uh, the regnant theology uh, that came down from the doctor of the church, uh, Richard uh, Lewontin, was that there was no such variation. But now right. we have the technology and we can just rub people's face in the reality, and they can't really <laughs> deny it. I mean, they can deny it, but their denials are very, very sophisticated. Uh, so usually normal people can't deny it. I just like show them the plot, and they're like, oh, uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when, so yeah, so when people, I mean, yeah, I think the conversation has actually changed because people will still deny racial differences or we can know racial differences, but the the uh, Stephen Jay Gould, Gould line, you know, I don't see that anymore. I don't see anyone, you know, most places saying that there is no biological difference between races. And just think about how absurd that is. I mean, just you have eyes, right? And you have these populations where there's zero overlap in what they look like, right? No Swede looks anything like a Nigerian in any physical trait, right? And you're going to say that has nothing to do with biology i mean it was absurd in the first place um mm-hmm. so you know it's it's like the 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 the, the low and ten and gold perspective wasn't didn't have any science behind yeah. it but it, it seems to have been it seems to have you know, the bubble has popped a little bit people don't make arguments that dumb anymore do they no um well dumb people do yeah uh, so you hear it from sociologists <laughs> right. Okay, <well. laughs> no, I mean, there are there, there are some. Um, I'll give you guys. I'll give you listeners a story. When That's I was in graduate, when I was I was I was in graduate school, and we were at um, a grad student event. A friend of mine, she's a veterinary geneticist uh, of Ashkenazi Jewish background, and we were talking about her potential risk for BRCA. And I was trying to just run some priors in my head because she had a, uh, an aunt who had breast cancer. And then I was like, well, the base rate for BRCA in the Ashkenazi population is, but like, let's. Uh, update it to your aunt and i said something about ashkenazi jews and the sociologist was a grad student event it was some social sociologist leans over and he did air quotes um jewish uh-huh. and like my, <laughs> <laughs> my friend was like looking at him like what the fuck <laughs> you know can i swear i mean he was just like she was like what what the fuck is he doing here and yeah. i was like uh we're talking about medical genetics sir and he's like yeah but quote unquote jewish what does that even mean yeah. And I'm just looking at him like, okay, like this is not like this is not fun time right no. now. I am talking about my friend's risk for breast cancer here. Um, I don't want to interrogate what you don't know about principal component analysis and population clustering right now. Yeah. You know? And so I mean that's the fundamental reality where uh you, you know, it is fun time and it is silly and esoteric for a lot of people. But then, like, there's medical relevance about what population you're clustering in and, and all of this stuff. Uh, and so, you know, you can push back yeah. against it a little. Yeah. Or they'll say, they'll just say race doesn't exist. Populations exist, right? And then the, yeah. the, 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 defini- the definition of race will be some kind of a, a straw man. Groups that have nothing in common and no genetic life at all. Like, yeah, that's what they'll do. They'll define yeah, it. No, it's, like, it's, it's a platonic. A pl- yeah, it's a platonic <laughs> ideal. So I feel like a lot of it is semantics, but... I I will be honest, most geneticists agree with this. I mean, whatever they believe about population structure, and most of them are not, uh, they're not stupid. They know how PCA works, but um, they will, in human population geneticists in particular, uh, they they do think that the term race, they ascribe it to some platonic ideal. 
Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is historically false, but I see why what they're trying to do. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm not, fine with that. If people don't, if people like, if the word has too much baggage and it's hindering understanding, and all they want to do is be able to say "quote unquote" race doesn't exist, like I'm happy to give them that, and then we can move on and talk about populations. Do you feel the same way? I mean, pretty much. I mean, I, I pretty much will just go along with it so long as it's not misleading. Yeah. Right. So if they want to say race doesn't exist, what's race? Race uh, is, you know, this platonic ideal of populations that have nothing in common. Okay, that doesn't exist. Now let's talk about populations. Let's talk about disease risk and, you know, these other differences. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very instrumental, right? Like, I mean, like, I, I want to, like, answer these questions and figure stuff out. I don't really want to, I don't really care too much what you call it. The main, yeah. the main caveat that I put on this, and I do tell population geneticists this, is once you, once you fly from one term to another, um, <laughs> you're misleading people often uh, in terms of like, they think, oh, race doesn't exist, therefore population structure doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is why the public is confused as to why 23andMe can do what it can do because they, they were told race doesn't exist. Yeah. You but know, but, they, but you it, know. It's, yeah, but it doesn't seem like they are confused about 23andMe, right? It seems like a lot of people, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of... I, I'm talking about like the more educate, humanities educated people, maybe with master's and PhD level, you know? I mean, regular normal people on the street, yeah, they're... Yeah, they're, they're not as they're, they're, they're They're woke, you know? Yeah. Um, but I'm talking about people that were uh, miseducated with doctorates in graduate school levels. Like they do have a little bit of perplexment because um, like I asked Kavali Forza this and, you know, LL Kavali Forza, uh, the late LL Kavali Forza, and he said basically... Um, the problem is that, yes, we are a young, genetically homogenous species, but that doesn't mean that we don't have phylogenetic structure and we can't infer phylogenies. And so that's the fundamental problem. People think we don't have phylogenetic structure and we can't infer phylogenies. So it's a common uh, misunderstanding to say that most population structure is uh, within populations. Therefore, people will literally tell me to my face, usually like lawyers and other people like that. Um, well, that means you can be as genetically, you can be more genetically closely related to someone in another race as your own sibling, which is just, that's just false. <laughs> it makes no intuitive sense. And, and it's also false, but they never really understood what Lawanta was saying in the first place. So yeah. for them, it's like some magical incantation. And then I, what I usually have to do is explain what the partitioning of variants really means and then explain that that's false. And then they usually look super confused because they don't know what partitioning of variants is. Yeah, we can we can get back to like you know how people perceive these things. Uh, but first, uh, so when I was a kid, um, we learned basically in school that there was this out of Africa model, and this is related to you know uh, being a young species and no such thing as race and all that. And basically, people left Africa; they populated the rest of the world uh, ten thousand years ago or so. Some of people in East Asia or Siberia they walked over to the New World uh, through Alaska, and then that's how you got Native Americans. Now that story is sort of true, but there's a lot more there that we found in the last 20, 10, 20 years. Can you talk about it broad strokes? You know, what have, what have we found since the time I was a kid, which was the 1990s? Yeah. So uh, in the 1990s, um, uh, you know, uh, into the early 2000s, my ex-boss, Spencer Wells, uh, he was involved, you know, he made a documentary called The Journey of Man. He wrote a book called The Journey of Man. And so what they were doing was they were taking mitochondrial DNA, well, uh, maternal lineages and Y chromosomes, the paternal lineages, and they were creating a phylogenetic um, tree, okay, back to a common ancestor, mitochondrial Eve, Y chromosomal Adam, and they were taking the phylogenies and laying them on the map. And so the root would be in Africa, Ethiopia, where the I think um, the earliest modern anatomically modern human existed or was di was discovered. I think, it's, I think it's not Kubi for. Uh, I forget, it might be the Awash. Uh, anyway, it's, it's a skull that looks like a hu modern human skull 200,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so that's when the coalescence of the mtDNA and why was. And there's a lot of arguments about that. I don't want to get into the detail because that's past history. But so you, you root the tree in Ethiopia and then you allow the tree to expand. And that's what you're talking about. You, ta you take this uh, phylogenetic tree and you spatially map it on. So the Y and the mtDNA are very useful for various reasons. Uh, the mtDNA is copious, so it was easy to extract. Also, there's no recombination. There's no segments of DNA between two parents that are. Uh, yeah, that, before we, I mean, before we lose people, I think you, you, you know, I think you sometimes skip ahead and people don't. So the, the basics are mtDNA. I know this is basic biology, but it comes through your mother, right? And what the Y chromosome comes from your father. Just so I mean, I think just yes. people have that background. Uh, cis males and cis females, as they would say today. Right. 
<laughs> or trans, or trans males, or yeah, that's too confusing. Let's, let's yeah, just, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, let's so, um, in any I'll case, listen. and so the, these don't recombine, which means they don't mix and match within your genome because normally you have two copies of genes, but here you only have one copy, right? Because the mtDNA is is a singular copy. I think it's circular DNA, and then you have um, the Y, which is just one chromosome, and so you can reconstruct a tree really easily. Uh, because it's all inherited together and it's not mished and mashed every generation. Um, so it was really easy computationally with the computers we had 20 years ago to construct these trees. So that's what we had. And it was a really neat story. And it, I mean, like neat in terms of like clean and elegant and simple, but that's because the models are clean and elegant and simple. And the inheritance pattern is clean and elegant and simple. What we know now, and you know this from David Reich's book because you've read it, is that instead of a family tree, um, we're looking more at like a lattice or a graph where there's like multiple expansions and and um, admixtures that are happening between different lineages because populations are mixing and um, sometimes they're going extinct and all of these like dynamic um, events that are basically uh, contingent events of history. So, for example, the hypothesis 20 years ago would be, well... We have this phylogenetic tree. Humans expand out of Africa. There's a linear decay in genetic diversity out of Africa as sampling from a smaller and smaller populations. Um, and so people arrive in Europe. They arrive in Australia. They arrive in the New World. And that's it. And the first settlers, in overwhelming m majority of cases, are the ultimate settlers. And everything is like marginal or secondary. You know, the new the the the, the, uh, the uh, European conquest of the New World is the exception, not the rule. Well. What we now know is the European conquest of the New World, New World is not the exception. Like, it's quite common. Um, so, for example, um, the creation of, like, these mestizo, mixed indigenous uh, Spanish or Iberian societies with, like, mixed cultures and all this stuff. Um, Christian Christiansen, an archaeologist in Denmark, is trying to organize a conference with specialists on this time of history, as along with Indo-Europeanists, because they see the same thing in the ancient DNA record, where these men from the steppe show up, and all the local men um, magically disappear, uh, as if they cast a spell on them. Um, I, I should mention that um, these Indo-European men, uh, they are buried uh, with very few items, and one of them is a mace. Uh -huh. So you can imagine what they do with the mace. So the, mest the mestizo model, I mean, that was the, where the new world, where basically if you look at uh, the people in Latin America, they're primarily descended from European men and Native American women, right? Yeah, that's a stylized places. fact, and that's what you see in Northern Europe to a great extent. And so uh, Christian Christiansen wants to integrate the insights of, of scholars that have worked on this model because, you know, he's like, we don't know about any of this stuff because our theory was they came, they came from the Pleistocene and all this stuff, and that's all false. There's been two turnovers, two major turnovers in Europe. Almost none, very little of the ancestry in modern Europe derives from the Pleistocene uh, or the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers. That was mostly replaced by people from the Near East, mostly Anatolia. Um, these were the early Neolithic farmers that put up Stonehenge, the megaliths, uh, they're the ancestors, culturally probably, of the Basques and the Etruscans and the ancient Paleo-Sardinians. These were overwhelmed um, within the last four to, four to 2,000 years, depending on where you are, um, by people from the Eurasian steppe, Indo-Europeans. And, uh, you know, it was male-mediated migration to a great extent. The Y chromosomes in most of Europe are dominated by Indo-European males. And so it's very, very m much like the creation of the mestizo culture in the New World. Uh, in, in, in German, a lot of the agricultural words seem to come from pre-Indo-European substrate. Um, and there are some words that are quite familiar, like lady, that seem to be pre-Indo-European. Um, and I think that there's a cultural reason why lady in particular is pre-Indo-European. I think the Indo-European men uh, integrated high-status women into their lineages. And so, you know, they call them ladies. Uh, that, that's my hypothesis for that. So, so, so the so what we found is that basically you're saying that four thousand years ago there was the entire population. I know this is all in Reich's book, but I forgot a lot of it. Four thousand years ago was the entire population of Europe replaced, or, or most of it, or what? It was a stepwise process, and actually, like <laughs> this is one thing. Reich's book is out of date. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was written in 2016 and 17, um, so that's a long time ago. <laughs> uh -huh. Six months ago is a long time ago in this yeah. field. Okay. Yeah. Um. And so uh, it's, it's generally correct, but here's some details we know now. Um, so basically what happened is there's an initial pulse from the forest steppe into northern Europe uh, called Corded Ware that diversifies into other cultures. So between 3000 and 2500 BC, all of northern Europe gets overwhelmed. Well, not all of, like there's parts of like Nordic country, like the far north that are isolated, but um, 
you know, gets overwhelmed step by. So it first starts in Poland, shows up in um, France, like around 2,500. And it also shows up in England around 2,500. So it's 500 years in Northern Europe, right? And then mm-hmm. there's a, so it's like genetically overwhelmed more or less, like, let's say like, let's say like two thirds to three fourths, something like that is step. Okay. And the rest is mostly indigenous, mostly farmer ancestry. Well, in yeah, Southern so- Europe, it's a, yeah. No, go ahead. Talk about Southern Europe. So in Southern Europe, the peninsulas, they get hit later. Like they get hit between 2000 and 2500 in general. Uh, We're starting to see steppe ancestry in Greece around like 2000, a little earlier, maybe 2200. Um, In Spain, it's 2200, 2300. The levels are lower. So whereas in Northern Europe, it's two thirds step in Southern Europe, it's closer to say like one third to 40% step, like like one third in Spain and Greece mm. um, and are actually lower in Greece. Like Greece is higher today because of Slavic migrations later. Um, and Italy is like 40%. So mm. each area has a certain proportion. And in Southern Europe is where you see non-Indo-European languages persist longer. So Etruscan famously, Basque is still around. The Greeks had these Pelasgian languages, which are like, they look like non-Indo-European languages. The, the construction NTH, like in Corinth, that is non-Indo-European. That is from the Mediterranean languages that pre-existed, that were existent there before. Yeah. it's. I mean, it's fascinating because you have all these pieces of the puzzle, right? You have linguistics and you have archaeology, and then you have genetics, which sort of just comes and puts a cherry on top or just over, over well, rules everything. Because it's so the, th- th- it's, this is, uh, this is uh, I haven't done this yet. Don't steal this idea from me. But you know that distracted, uh, dis- distracted boyfriend meme? Sure. So oh, okay. My, I, I see uh, where you're going. Yeah. yeah so um, so uh, the girlfriend is archaeologists. The distracted boyfriend are the historical linguists, and um, the the hot girl is the geneticists. So there's right. a lot of like realignments <laughs> happening here uh, because the historical linguists in particular have taken to genetics because, uh, to be entirely frank, they've turned out to be mostly right. Uh, the archaeologists have a lot of facts, but they have no theory, and a lot of their, a lot of their theories, a lot of their uh, overarching frames are wrong or were wrong. They were falsified, and so they're t- having to readjust. Because imagine spending thirty years um, on a particular framework and a theory, and the geneticists, uh, David Reich and and colleagues, just show up and they're like, "Actually, you're wrong," and then they just walk off because they have other things to publish. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's fascinating because you're talking about 2000 BC, where a huge portion of Europe, right, a third to two thirds was replaced. And that's in, that's during recorded history, not in European history, right? But you have the Hittites and the, and the Babylonians and, and uh, ancient Egypt. And the European population is completely different. Like we have that yeah. within the crime frame of recorded history. That's just mind blowing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I like to, the stylized fact that I like to tell people at conferences, because sometimes I go to genealogy conferences, mostly European, Northern European, I'm like, I'm looking around in the audience, um, pretty much nobody that was genetically like the people in the audience existed when the pyramids of Egypt were going up. That's a fact. That's fascinating. So these people, like, uh, so people are worried about. There's like sort of a right wing sort of uh, interpretation of the stuff. There's also like a left wing, you know, something that can make liberals happy, which is idea. Like I've seen like uh, r- racialists, like European, like uh, uh, nationalists say, you know, we've been the same people for thirty thousand years, and now we're being replaced by the immigrants, right? And that's not true. It doesn't go back that far, right? No, they've been the same people for 3,000 years. Yeah, so it, maybe, I don't know if anybody cares. <laughs> I don't know if anyone cares about I mean, they, they, they care because, you know. Yeah, yeah. I guess. I you guess, know, yeah. they yeah. think yeah. we've been here since the Ice Age and, and, and stuff. And I'm just like, no, no, you weren't. You were, uh, yeah. first of all, like, there was no you. Like, there were different strands of ancestry. Some of them were in West Asia. Some of them were in Siberia. Some of them were in Europe, you know. Yeah. So, so that's the, that's uh, Europe. Yeah. I mean, the lingu. The, do you think the linguistics? I mean, the linguistics people were right because they were operating so long ago that they were operating sort of below before political correctness. Because what I what seems like the archaeologists got wrong is they didn't like all this stuff about like men taking women and like fighting wars and killing people and like taking wives and sort of Indo-European has that connotation with you know uh, yeah. you know uh, Ari- like the Aryan uh, stuff you know uh, uh, the stuff that was going on in Germany in the 1930s and Mm -hmm. 40s so was it was it just that the linguistics started earlier and then the people who came later the archaeologists were just operating at a time period where our brains just sort of shut off for political reasons yeah but i also think um i mean it's hard 
it's hard uh, for linguists to like just straight up lie about the cognates and the similarities. Like Indo-European languages are recognizable to each other, right. uh, even by lay people. Uh, archaeology is easier to delude yourself, I think, partly because it's more abstruse. You know, like you can look at pottery and convince yourself, oh, well, actually, this is like a stepwise change. Or, for example, Christian Christiansen, the Danish archaeologist, he believes one reason that there is some continuity between Neolithic fa farmer pottery and the corded ware pottery of the steppe people is that the people making the pottery uh, were women that were kidnapped from Neolithic farmer societies. So that's a different explanation for the continuity, but the continuity did exist. The archaeologists didn't understand where it was coming from. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes, yeah, you're right. I mean, anyone can look at, say, English and Persian or Hindi and see they're more similar than, you know, English and Finnish, right? I mean, anyone, anyone can, that's very verifiable. So, yeah, you're right. That gives you less room to, uh, uh, well, to sort I, of be creative. Well, yeah, I'll, right? I'll, I'll give your listeners an example for like where it's like, you're just like, okay, like, what, what is this? This has got something weird here. So, I'm reading uh, the Mahabharata, which is the Indian national, well, it's one of the major Indian national epics, dates to like, let's say, 3,000 years ago. Uh, well, I mean, the events, uh, it might have been composed like 2000. I don't know. In any case, there's a section where they talk about um, how like this person's not righteous because they're copulating during the day. Okay. There is structurally an exact replica mm -hmm. of that passage in the Iliad uh -huh. where Paris and Helen are copulating during the day. Uh -huh. So, like, what's going on here? Um, you know, you could say that it's some weird borrowing, but I think the most plausible explanation is for some reason the steppe pastoralists and the Indo-European uh, Pontic steppe, uh, you know, they never they, they never had a thing like, you know, when, during the day when the wagons are rocking, don't come a-knocking. Because they had a social norm when that stuff happened at night. And yeah. that persisted in their descendants even long after the the wagon period. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Cause you have these mythologies too, not just, not just the language and sort of these similarities. Uh, so that's, you know, that's Europe and the Eurasian step. Uh, what do we know about, um, let's go, let's start with, I want to go, go into the two major regions of the world, China, uh, and India. What do we know about India? What, what does Reich say? And what do we, what do we know since Reich, if anything else? Yeah. I mean, Reich is generally correct, so, but the, the primary difference is in Reich's book, uh, he posited that Indians are a fusion of three populations, uh, one distantly related to the Andamanese Islanders, uh, so kind of like indigenous to Southeast Asia, uh, dark-skinned, uh, you know, more related to Chinese people, at least distantly, than West Eurasians. Are those the uh, people uh, they call uh, Negritos? Uh, yes, uh, but uh, back in the day, they were on the mainland, and they weren't so small. You know? Okay. So yeah. Okay. They weren't small, but the, now they're the people who are, are are pygmies, but they're not in Africa. They're they're yeah. The, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. They're and the, so uh, um, that's that's one component, and then another component are the steppe people, the Sintashta, uh, the Sintashta people. That's still that's still valid. Uh, basically, the Sintashta people uh, they descend from um, a a copper working violent uh, culture, agropastoralist culture that flourished between the Ural and the Volga about four thousand years ago. Um, my Y chromosome, R1A, Z93, 80% uh, of the males in that society had it. Uh, it seems to come from Western Russia and have percolated eastward into the Urals over like 500 years. And then from there, it expanded. And so this post Sintashta culture uh, went from Hungary to China to India to um, Syria. Uh, they introduced the light war chariot. They seem to have invented the light war chariot. And there's a paper coming out. Um, for a fact, which uh, has found that all the world's domestic horses descend from Sintashta horses. Uh, Equus Colobus is a Sintashta horse. So um, the Sintashta Indo-Iranians, uh, they gifted the domestic horse to the whole world, basically. Um, so that's a big deal. Um, we know that since the right paper came out. Um, it, it's not published yet, but they uploaded the data and they uploaded the abstract and it's all in there. Um, mm -hmm. And so the third thing is the biggest thing is... Uh, in the Reich book, they said that uh, Indus Valley people are a mix of AASI, ancient ancestral South Indians, these Anamanese groups at low level, and predominantly Iranian farmers. What they found is this Iranian farmer component that's more related to West Eurasians, it's very, very distinct from West Iranian farmers in the Zagros Mountains. And those people are distinct from or modern Iranians who are mixed with steppe ancestry, Arab ancestry, all these other things, right? There's a deep fission between East Iranian farmers and West Iranian farmers separated by the deserts dating to the late Pleistocene. And so um, 
you know, it's possible that these people were living in Pakistan. I think it's more likely that they were living in like Afghanistan, Eastern Iran, Khorasan. Um, they have some connections to Siberia. Uh, but basically, people of Indian subcontinental heritage, of, of genetic background, it did not exist until 3,500 years ago, at the earliest. Uh, because most most people of Indian subcontinent origin are a mixture of these three groups. And, um, you know, people before that, there's there's some ancient DNA now. They don't look like that at all. They look mostly a mixture of the two groups. And then if you go far back enough, they're probably not even a mixture of like the Iranians the Eastern Iranians and the AASI, these Negrito groups. Uh, they're probably separate, separated by the Thar Desert, I'm assuming, during the Pleistocene when things were much drier. Yeah, and so, you, but then you have the caste system, right, which has a deep biological basis. And I found this shocking. I mean, I think what Reich said was uh, that the castes in India have a more distant, like three times as much distance between them as European nations. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. I mean, so... Basically, in Europe and China, you can predict genetic variation by geography because in local region, there's roughly random mating. Like the old Chinese saying is three generations up and three generations down, which was actually exaggerated. But in any case, um, it looks like in India, like some of these castes have been separated for 1,500 to 2,500 years. Their endogamy rates are 99.5% at the uh, lowest Wow. Um, and so basically what I tell Indians is like, I can't no, no, no geneticist I have talked to actually has a good explanation of how people can maintain this because, uh, um, you know, humans, human males, uh, they tend to do things, you know, yeah. uh, is, that, is between, that break is down between, these, is this between the, the, the five major casts or is this between like all the thousands? Uh, of so, different okay. Like I, for the Brown listeners, I got to correct you here. So th there's, there's five, there's four major Varnas. Okay. Uh -huh. And so the Indian word is Varna. And so Varna okay. would be like the Brahmins, you know, about the like Kshatriyas, the warriors, uh, the Vashyas are like, kind of like the merchants and the free citizens. And then in the Aryan society, there were also the Sudras who were kind of, uh, you know, the lower classes. And so, uh, the code of Manu, which is like, you know, a theoretical exposition of this, which, yeah, really not really it was more like in the honored in the breach than in the practice is like the brahmin is the mouth the head uh the kshatriya is the arms right and then um the the vashya is uh is the thighs right a power society and then the shudra is the feet okay it's so okay. the bottom of society and so um that's the standard model and then like outside of it they're the outcasts they call them dalits now so they're outside of the hindu system and the tribal people, the Adivasi, they're also outside the Hindu system. We know genetically that all these populations exist in a continuum. They come out of the same milieu, the same matrix. So the Adivasis, these tribal people, it's not like they're like American Indians. They're actually out of the same type of mixtures in different proportions as, say, a Brahmin. Okay? Um, so it's all on a spectrum. But what, what we find is... Um, even in the same villages, and this is what this is what Reich is alluding to, uh, like in South India, there are populations that are genetically as distinct as Finns and Italians in the same villages who speak the same language, but they're yeah. part of what's called different jati. And so jati, there are thousands of jatis, and there are four varnas, right? And so um, there are there are like you know dozens of Brahmin castes across India, and they don't intermarry. There are Brahmins in the southern state of Tamil Nadu. They all speak Tamil. Um, it's like, you know, language of like 60, 70 million people. And there are Brahmins. There are like three or four Brahmin communities. They call it communities in English. They're Jatis. They don't even intermarry, right? There's one Brahmin community called Ayangar. I think that they're mostly um, devoted to the god Vishnu. And then there's another Brahmin community called Ayers. They're devoted to the god Shiva. And they don't traditionally intermarry. They have started intermarrying today. But traditionally, they would not intermarry, and it was totally taboo. It was totally taboo for Brahmins from different states to intermarry, from you know different communities to intermarry. Um, and obviously, they wouldn't intermarry with the non-Brahmins, and the non-Brahmins themselves wouldn't intermarry with each other. So maybe within your locality, there would be three or four uh, Dalit castes, like you know outcasts, right? Uh, they would not intermarry with each other either. So the reason that Indian populations are so weird is that it's not like there's just like four castes that don't intermarry. There's like 3,000 or whatever castes that don't intermarry. Jatis. So they call it the Jati Varna system. And this is super weird, and it doesn't really exist anywhere else. It's uh -huh. basically like it's, as if every Indian group are like Ashkenazi Jews. That's amazing. That is, that is amazing. So how do so they, they start mating. They might have some hybrid vigor. This might be the future of India. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, David Reich does talk about this. Uh, there's a lot of genetic diseases that are due to this sort of endogamy. Even though most of these groups right. don't engage in cousin marriage, they all look like cousins. 
because uh, they've only been marrying each other for a long time. And so there's a paper out of his group that talks about like the fact that like I, like hundreds and hundreds of millions of Indians are more genetically uh, homogeneous than Finns, which is like kind of like the boundary condition of being genetically homogeneous in India or not India yeah. in Europe. Right. And so if you have out marriage, even minimal out marriage, it should expose the recessive diseases uh, to heterozygosity. And so the morbidity rate should just automatically drop. So uh, they do have a potential as they and they are starting the, the exogamy rates are going up to like five to 10 percent, which like seems low to you. But it's about like 10 to 100 times what it was in the past uh, in the past century. So you were saying we don't have any theory of how this could have been maintained for how long? How long is this that we're talking? How many thousands of years? Yeah, one thousand five hundred years is usually the date that people use. They say that it it, it emerged crystallized during the Gupta because these groups emerged out of admixtures, right? So like it's not like they were endogamous forever. They emerged out of admixtures between very distinct units, distinct populations. Different Brahmin groups are different because they mixed with local populations and stuff like that. But yeah, for like say like a thousand to two thousand years, that's a good that's a good winter interval. Yeah, and and so there's a, the, you have no speculation or theories or ideas how this could have been maintained because it's obviously it's not some kind of genetic super strong genetic predisposition because it's being overcome today, right? Uh, so these people are out marrying. So how do you yeah. how do you maintain that for that long? I mean, you know what? You're you're the social scientist. I mean, you got to figure out like basically it's a system where me, uh, elite men I mean, so I here's a hypothesis. Like um we know that like sexual exploitation of Dalit women is uh is uh, like, to be frank, uh, well, most of your listeners aren't Indian so they're not going to get offended. Endemic <laughs> uh, in large parts of Indian society, okay? Um, so, like, how, why aren't the Dalits totally, uh, you know, transformed genetically? I, I think part of it has to do, like, infanticide. Uh, like, I think ubiquitous infanticide would keep it down. Um, also, like, the extreme uh, residential segregation would keep it down. Um, I know that, you know, there's copulation in the fields and stuff like that, but that's in public. So you're at risk. Uh, the sanctions would be extremely strong. Um, and also like maybe non-procreative sex. Like, I mean, I'm just like spitballing here, but because again, like the first time these results showed up, uh, I know David Reich and I, you know, like it's amazing to them. Like it, it, it's amazing to geneticists. Like it just doesn't, it, it's just inexplicable. Like at an exogamy rate that low is just like, wait, what's going on? Like you're living in the same town, uh, with these people for like a thousand years and you're just not cheating on each other because like, fundamentally i can understand like social sanctioning against intermarriage but like they're not even cheating on each other because they're not genes not flowing between the pop maybe they are cheating and maybe it's infanticide and non-procreative sex that's the only thing that i can uh, posit there yeah but the thing is i mean you could that could make sense for a generation or two or several generations uh but you know, cultures change over time, right? Maybe some you'd, you'd have like a humanitarian movement or you'd have some kind of movement or, you know, you'd have just uh, women who would escape and not let them, not let the father kill the baby, right? You you, th mm -hmm. you think there's so much that could happen, right? This includes like the British, you know, taking over India, this, uh, you know, as the rise and fall of empires and still nothing. It's but, still so just... There was, a, there was a Eurasian caste that emerged, right? So the Anglo-Indian Eurasians, um, they were generally the products of, uh, so there's there's different groups. Like after 1840, uh, the intermarriages between high status Indian women and high status British men stopped. Uh, the social norm of that ceased. So actually, there is um, what is it, Lord? I think Lord Liverpool was a prime minister in the early 19th century. His mom's side were actually Eurasian. Uh, they were from the mercantile community of India. Or they're from the market of East India Company, and so they had um, Indian heritage through their mothers. Um, he wasn't very Indian, but he did have Indian heritage, right? And so that was a thing in the 19th century. And like, uh, if you uh, um, if you read Dalrymple, uh, uh, you know he has like white Mughals. That, but but that ended, and then most of the Congress interaction occurred between low status Indian women, uh, you know whatever, like marginally, economically marginalized, socially marginalized, and, uh, you know, non-commissioned officers or just like ranking soldiers, you know, like low-status soldiers, or they could be high-status, but they kept them as mistresses, right? Um, and so the children, um, they culturally identified and were raised as English or, you know, like they're Christian, usually Anglican or Catholic. You know, the stereotype is Eurasians have a picture of the queen in their house and all this stuff. Uh, there's, they're, the st and, so, and they were lighter-skinned, obviously, than other Indians on average. And so that's positive because Indians are super obsessed with light skin. But 
they were low status because of their origins and uh you know you know low caste women with like you know these these like low low class yeah, european that, men that, that, that deepens the mystery right because you had the british come in and then you start to have mixing right so there were invasions all the time right i mean there was uh you know the, you have the mongol empire you have the you know you have all this stuff going on you have uh alexander the great you have you know uh, but that, that was earlier but then you have uh you have islam and you have all these things and they still maintain this stuff yeah. it, well, so it, not it, in bangladesh uh, in bangladesh it's gone now okay in pakistan it's maintained uh uh-huh, the cast the cast uh differences. yeah i mean they call it something different they have and in northwest india they have something even more complicated called birdari which is like a clan system but i mean arabs have tribes so it's similar to that so that's overlaid on a caste system but if you look at the genetic structure in pakistan it looks indian uh there's a lot of clustering and a lot of differentiation and if you look at the genetic structure in bangladesh and you plot it on a pca it looks like europe insofar as you uh, in european nations just like china you create this like ort cloud you know, this like kind of like fuzzy cloud because there's no internal structure. Okay. Um, you know, P- Genesis will know what I'm talking about here. Bangladesh looks like that. There's no internal structure, really. It's just like all random, random generated noise. Um, so, yeah. So is it, was it, was it, was it the Indian subcontinent for most of its history? Wasn't really that touched because, you know, the British, you know, they, they uh, took over India, but I know a lot mm-hmm. of India was untouched. And was it perhaps, yeah. you know, if, if you just avoid sort of modernization, you avoid contact with the modern state, you know, you can sort of maintain yeah. your religion indefinitely, your, your yeah, sense I, I, of certainty I, about the it's, universe. It's kind of a mystery, but yeah, like that's a hypothesis. And to be fair, um, upper class Muslims were much more cosmopolitan. A lot of them have paternal lineages from Iran and to a lesser extent the Arab world, but particularly Iran and Central Asia. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they also, like the Europeans tended to intermarry with them in particular because Islam and Christianity were perceived to be more similar religions. And, you know, if uh, a European man had children with a Muslim woman, the children could be raised, uh, and this is in Dalrymple's book, White Mughals, the children could be raised as Muslim, and it was socially acceptable for them to be raised as Muslim, um, even if they didn't have caste, because officially Muslims don't have caste, right? So the maintenance of caste within Muslim society has tended to be within Indian Muslims with local indigenous roots, whereas um, the international cosmopolitan, they call it the Ashraf elite, uh, who have connections to Iran and Central Asia, um, they tend to be genetically more mixed. Um, they tend to preserve uh, their Central Asian or Iranian heritage too, with like taboos against intermarriage with natives. Although they do intermarry with natives, it's just that uh, um, you know they they want to remain lighter skinned and more West Asian looking, and they try to keep that. Yeah, that's fascinating. So yeah, that's that's India. That's you know one of the rising one of the two major rising nations in the world today. Uh, but one point you know two billion people or whatever it is now. The other one is China. And my impression from reading Reich is that China is a much simpler case. Can you talk about the genetic history of China, how it differs from India? Yeah, um, it is. Uh, there's some ways where it's similar to Europe, and some ways where it's similar to. Um, well, I mean, there's some ways where it's similar to Europe, and there's some ways where Europe is similar to India, not to China. So China is simple because, um, like Europe, most of the genetic, like 90% of the genetic variation is explicable through geography. And so China is partitioned into a north versus south, and to a lesser extent versus east versus west. And that's the exact same as Europe, uh, mostly because uh, the mountains uh, in China, like, like that. not the Kunlun, I forget which mountains there were in the middle. But basically, the barriers in China are north-south. Um, not east west, and the barriers in Europe are similar. Similarly, mostly north south, and so yeah. you know it's easy to position a north Chinese versus a south Chinese. But there's not much like structure internally, like caste system type stuff, where it's like, oh well, this is this particular sub Chinese community, blah blah blah. Um, the yeah. one exception are the Hakas, who are migrants from north China into south China, particularly Guangdong and southern part of Fujian. Um, uh-huh. They are genetically a little bit different than their south Chinese neighbors. Um, they are residentially segregated insofar as uh, traditionally they came and occupied the crappier farmland zones, like the tops of hills, uh, because they came later, you know? So that's the exception. But in general, China is characterized by a random mating situation, as you see in Europe. Uh, there's no caste structure. The Chinese do have a class structure of obviously bureaucrats, bureaucrats uh, and the emperor on top, and then the farmers, and then below them, artisans, and then below them, the merchants. I think the art- about military is with the artisans. But like these people kept go went up and went down. Uh, they didn't have a blood nobility traditionally. I mean, the Tang Dynasty came close, but really it wasn't formalized in a European way. And so there's been a lot of mobility up and down and a lot of mixing. And also, um, in China, what really, really matters, from what I know, is your paternal lineage. And so uh, a lot of these, like, say, South Chinese are particularly really patrilineal for various regions. And, um, you know, you could marry into 
uh, the Han Chinese identity. Uh, and, you know, you just get assimilated. Like the Han just assimilated people. So people in northern China tend to have, like, say, 1% to 5% West Eurasian ancestry. Um, it could be Mongol. It could be something earlier. I think it's probably Mongol because the Mongols themselves are about, like, you know, 10 to 15% West Eurasian. Um, mostly Iranian because the Iranians introduced the the horse and the chariot and all that stuff into the eastern steppe, uh, and so you have some differences between the north and the south, uh, and that's about it. But in general, Chinese are actually for a nation of one point four or five billion or whatever, they're actually shockingly mm. genetically homogenous. The differences are actually pretty marginal, and they're actually quite distinct from their ethnic minorities, which are only like about five percent. of Five to ten percent of the population, really closer to five, because some of them, like Manchus, are like Elizabeth Warren Manchus. They're all mm. Elizabeth Warren Manchus. You know, <laughs> like they're they they just do it for affirmative action. They don't really have any Manchu identity anymore, and so their ethnic minorities can be kind of distinct because they've been endogamous. But uh, the 90, 90 95 percent of the Han Chinese, they're they're pretty similar to each other, even though they do vary from north to south and whatnot. That's funny. The Manchus have affirmative action because they were they were the conquerors. So that that sort of makes no sense at all. Yeah, but the, you know, they're one of they're one of the five five great races that like you know came together during the Republic of China. So they get a little special. But yeah, so I they they traditionally didn't have to do the one child and all those other things. And so uh, there was a mysterious bump in the number of Manchus for several censuses. But the, the language is dead, and the cultural identity is pretty much dead. They they don't just intermarry with each other, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you, you've talked about in other places, uh, sort of Indians and how interested they are in this genetic research and how they talk to you about it. This seems to be, you know, very interesting from a Chinese perspective, you know, for a culture obsessed with, you know, national uh, civilizational unity, it seems to sort of, uh, you know, back up sort of what they want to believe. Do you know of any interest in China in these kind of results? Well, there are Chinese genetic companies that do pro- the Chinese versions of 23andMe and stuff. It's all internal to China. Um, but yeah, so so one thing Chinese are interested in, just like Arabs uh, uh, to some extent, uh, paternal lineages. Uh, they want to validate their paternal lineages, their genealogy books. Like the lineage of Confucius still exists today. You know, there's yeah. like there, there's thousands of men who are part. I mean, there's more than thousands, but like the ones that are known. There's a family that still maintains the, the home temple. There are also Muslim def- descendants of Confucius, like a, a man who was a descendant who married a Muslim. And so all different, these, all these people, they're curious on some level. At some point, they'll probably check. They're also confident, though, in being Chinese and in their genealogy. So that kind of mitigates against consumer consumption of these sorts of products. Um, there are some people, especially American-born Chinese, who, you know, they look a little bit more Southeast Asian and they want to explore that. So they te- get themselves tested. It turns out they're 100% Chinese. It's just there's variation of physical appearance in China. People in Southern China do have a minority component of ancestry that's indigenous. Um, so I think in uh, in uh, Guangdong, uh, around uh, you know Canton, Guangzhou, uh, you know the the people are like the the Zhuang. I think that's the ethnic group that was like do- and the UA that was dominant in the region, and they assimilated them. But there's some cultural practices like wedding practices that don't seem regularly Chinese. They they're probably indigenous, and it tends to be through the maternal lineage again. And so, um, you know, especially in South China, there's these indigenous groups that contribute a substantial proportion of their ancestry. In North China, I think um, it's more likely that the the ancestry is from Mongols and other groups. Um, After the fall of the Mongol Empire, they were given um, several choices, like they either escaped to Mongolia, like the elite did, um, they were killed. Or uh, they they were forcibly intermarried with Han Chinese, and so their ethnic identity disappeared. So I did write something on my Substack uh, in late February um, when there were reports about Uyghur women being married to Han Chinese men. I did I did point out that this is actually like not some great innovation of the People's Republic. This is something that the Chinese Empire has done multiple times, where they forcibly uh, intermarry people to like absorb them and make them go away. Yeah, so that's I mean that's all that's all fascinating. Yeah, you I mean because you have I guess this this is a difference because of what I was just saying about India in that China you know has the, uh, pretty much the longest history of uh, unquestionably the longest continuous state in human history, right? And it was a competent state if you read the history. You know they could they could uh, measure you know they could measure populations, they could do censuses, they could you know collect taxes down to a pretty uh, granular le- granular level. I mean for the time, right? Um, and it seems like that facilitates mixing, right? So this is what happened. This is sort of like something that India doesn't get until like the 20th century, right? Um, yeah. And there's got to be there's got to be a, a connection between that long history of statehood and effective mm-hmm. statehood and more genetic homo- homogeneity. 
Yeah, yeah. So I think like, one thing that you see from Reich's book and other work is um, basically before states, uh, before agriculture, um, there was a lot more genetic difference difference in small areas because people weren't intermarrying. Like there was really, really intense uh, in-group bias and out-group hostility. And so what you see with the rise of agriculture and empires is collapsing of genetic distance all across the world. So we're seeing like a great panmixia. Um, just driven by gene flow. And like the stylized fact in population genetics is you only need one individual between two different uh, populations per generation to prevent them from diverging. And there's some technical reasons for this, but basically you need very little gene flow uh, per generation to homogenize two groups. And so that's what happened. So for example, in the Middle East, um, Western Iran, uh, like six, 7,000 years ago, was very, very genetically distinct from uh, the Levant, uh, the, the post-Natufian cultures. Uh, the genetic distinction is that pairwise FST is 0.1, which is what's between China and Northern Europe today. Um, today, that doesn't exist anymore because there was gene flow west and gene flow east. There was a great mixing. And by the time we get to the Sumerian period, uh, Iraq is undersampled thanks to the invasion. So I'm going to put that out there. Um, but we do have data from other places, and it does look, by the time you get to the historical period, everyone's pretty mixed up, even though there's still a climb. Right. Yeah. The Middle East is sort of closer. I mean, it's sort of something like Latin America, right? Where you look for it, you don't look that deep into history because you see the invasions and you see the, the slave trade. Uh, yes. Not as recently as Latin America, but still pretty pretty recently during you know, yes. during historical times. It's the Isla- Islamic period drove most of the sub-Saharan African gene flow, although some of it did predate it. Yeah. So your uh, your latest Substack, as of this, you know, as of us speaking right now, um, is called "A Whole New World." It's about uh, it's about the New World, right? The uh, Western Hemisphere, and it, it, you know, it's fascinating. I, I remember reading this in, in Reich's book, and it's good to just you know be reminded of it. There is a population uh, called ancient uh, North Europeans. Is that right? And they are- ancient North Eurasians. Uh, ancient North Eurasians, right? And they somehow that they have they were separated from the ancestors of uh, East Asians and Europeans. Yeah, but uh, they, they separated from East Asians first. So basically, when you look at the tree, there's a separation of East Asians and everybody else, well, East Eurasians and everybody in Western Eurasia, about like fifty thousand years ago. And then there's a separation between ancient North Eurasians and everybody else in West Eurasia about thirty eight thousand years ago. And then those people combined with uh, paleo Siberians, right, to form the Native Americans. So yes. when you look at the PCA, there's a there's a part of there is a um, how does this work? So the the, Euro- the Europeans are uh, there's an ans- a group that is that is uh, that is both an ancestor to Europeans and uh, Native Americans. But not East yes. Asians, right? So yes, that's exactly. And so that's why there's an affinity. Um, so in the more primitive analyses, there was always some stuff that suggested an affinity to uh, to West Eurasians, uh, which was always weird because they're further away from West Eurasians than East Asians. And so what we now know is these A and E ancient North Eurasians are source population all across Eurasia. Uh, and also into the into the Native Americans. And so there are East Asian population that went north about 30,000 years ago, maybe earlier, and it eventually mixed with these these uh, ancient North Eurasians. Uh, and so eventually they went, went into the New World, blah, 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 the rest is history. But there's another aspect of the ancient North Eurasians that um, expanded westward into Eastern Europe, and they contributed about, let's see, maybe about 40% of the ancestry of the Yamnaya people on the Pontic steppe. And so today in Northern Europe, about like 10 to 20% of the ancestry, depending on the population, is ancient North Eurasian, right? So let's say like 15% of the, like, let me give you a concrete example, like 15% of the ancestry of a German person is ancient North Eurasian, and 35% of the ancestry of a uh, Algonquin Indian, that's like a pure-blooded Algonquin Indian, is ancient North Eurasian. And so you have these distant ancestors like 25,000 years ago, and that creates the affinity um, in terms of the paradoxes we see genetically. Yeah, and the, I mean, the important point is that would be there would be zero in the Chinese, right, from the ancient... Uh, yeah, I, it's not actually zero, but it's very low, just, just to be uh-huh. clear. 
Yeah, that's a, I mean that's absolutely that is absolutely fascinating, and we haven't even gotten to um, the other find the other interesting sort of family of findings is that we're not fully the same. We're not all fully human, right? There are other species within us. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, if you talk to a paleoanthropologist, they'll agree with you exactly the way you said it because they have a narrow view of human. Right. Uh, if you talk to a geneticist, most of us are just like, I mean, what does that even mean? Um, we, de- we tend to have like a, a broad view of what human is. So, you know, this is the case where the geneticists are not the bad guys. They're not the evil scientists. It's the paleoanthropologist. Paleoanthropologists, uh, people don't like it when I say this because uh, I impute, uh, you know, rational behavior to scientists. They like to be splitters and create as many species as possible because that, that, that allows them to name and it gives them precedence and stuff like that. Geneticists, we're not splitters. Uh, we would actually prefer everyone to just be called human and not to use the species differentiators. But we don't get yeah. to, well, we don't well, get to I, decide I, that. So, I mean, is there with these, when they, when they break up, when they're splitters, when they're breaking up these different, uh, when they're breaking up these uh, different humanoids, human-like uh, uh, skulls into different species, how, how big are those differences? I mean, like, are they comparable to differences between human races? If there was like, some human races that were extinct, say, and mm-hmm. all we had was the skulls, would these, uh, would these splitters consider that a different species? Or is, it, is what's considered human, what's alive hu- and human today, uh, that mm-hmm. obviously different from uh, all the extinct the people that they would call, the yeah. people they would call not human? I'm not, I'm not like the most... Um... I'm not the most like uh, versed in the skull stuff, but if you look at a Neanderthal skull, you're like, oh damn, that's what is that? Okay, so it's, it's visible. Like they would, they would look very robust, et cetera, et cetera. The anthropologist John Hawks though does point out there are some modern humans who do reach um, a lot of the Neanderthal metrics, even if not all of them together. Often, uh, there are some like hunt, like hunter gatherers tend to be more robust. Um, Australian Aborigines, for example, have much more robust skull morphology mm-hmm. than any other modern human population um and so you know there's variation within our own stem lineage that's what we call it stem lineage like that's the dominant ancestry but yeah like two like what you're saying though is like two to about seven percent of the ancestry outside of africa depending on the population is from lineages that diverged a long time ago uh neanderthals and then a set of human populations that we bracket together as denisovans and so the neanderthal one is relatively straightforward i think at this point there are some details which i won't get into but basically uh, modern humans push out of africa and they're in the middle east and there they encounter a neanderthal tribe and they mix with that neanderthal tribe they absorb it in totality and you know there's this like you know supra super like you know like supra uh proto eurasian group that has about five percent neanderthal ancestry that percentage drops over time because of s- negative selection within the genome the neanderthals diverged from our own lineage about seven hundred fifty thousand years ago the deepest break deepest lineages we see with modern humans assuming a tree-like more phylogeny is actually two hundred thousand years two hundred to three hundred thousand years with the khoisan there is no reproductive barrier between khoisan and non-khoisan that geneticists have been able to see. There's various statistics you can do in the genome to confirm that. Um, there is clearly a reproductive barrier between Neanderthals and modern humans. There are statistics that you can do that shows that Neanderthal genomes are being selected against because of their incompatibility. So when we say that 2 to 3% of non-African ancestry is Neanderthal, that's a little lower than what it was initially. Like Maybe you could double that uh, because it's been slowly selected against. In any case, um, so you have this initial Neanderthal mixture, and then some people go into Europe. There's actually further mixture with Neanderthals. Uh, we actually have an individual from Romania 40,000 years ago that had a great-grandparent who was a Neanderthal, or a great-great-grandparent. Uh, but this individual didn't leave any descendants in modern human populations. And it looks like most of the Neanderthal ancestry, or if not all of it, is from one particular tribe in the Middle East. But there were other admixtures that we, can, that we have actually detected. And it's because humans tend to replace each other and go extinct in the northern Eurasia so often that I don't think we see we have signature of the other ones. We do have a half Neanderthal, half Denisovan girl uh, detected in Altai in the Denisova cave. Uh, and so she is the product of a Denisovan father and a, um, and a, De- a, a, and a Neanderthal woman. So uh, Denisovans and Neanderthals are related. They separated, say, four to six hundred thousand years ago, depending on what statistics. So they call their their lineage that we call Neandersovans, 
and they're considered sister lineages. Their genetic differences are greater um, in terms of time than between any other non, uh, between like anyone else in the Khoisan. So they're pretty distinct. And the Denisovans themselves seem to be divided into a lot of deeply different lineages. Neanderthals are all pretty much the same because they were mixing across this whole zone from the Atlantic all the way to Mongolia. But the Denisovans go all the way from Siberia, probably into deep tropical Southeast Asia. And if you recall, in China, China and in Europe, you see that there's way much, way more genetic distance north to south, and I think the same thing applies to ne- to Denisovans. Now, there's evidence that there's been admixture of Denisovans uh, into a Papua New Guinea, possibly twice into the Papuans, uh, independently into India and in low levels, independently into Tibet and China at low levels, and also independently in the Philippines at low levels. And so, and the levels are like you know 0.1 to 0.2 percent in the Indian subcontinent in China, all the way to five percent in Papua. So yeah, that's huge. There you go. I mean, this, yeah, this this seems amazing. I mean, the, the fact that there's you know two, three, five percent that were just different species that correlates with race. I mean, I think that that is a further destruction of the no such thing as as race dogma because you know we're we're in part we're in part you know a tenth or a twentieth of you, which is not nothing. Uh, we're different species, so I mean that that alone seems like a pretty big deal. Yeah, I mean it's a pretty it's a pretty amazing. And I heard I heard through the grapevine that like you know some geneticists were worried that people in Papua would be like, "Are you trying to say we're not human?" But I've heard that like actually, uh, the there aren't that many Papuans who keep track of paleoanthropology, but the ones that did, <laughs> ones that did in Port Moresby, were actually quite proud of it. Yeah, because because it made them really unique. Yeah, I mean, if I had, I mean, if I had something that was like more robust and healthy, I mean, we always romanticize, right? It's the noble savage thing. I think everyone has this to a certain extent now. Uh, so I think, I think we, I think I we mean, it's called I, we call it the Denisovan princess syndrome. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. So Neanderthals are sort of like Chinese, is what you're saying, because they're pretty much homogenous. Yes, and Denisovans yes. are more like Indians, right? Yeah, that's a good that's a good distinction. Um, Neanderthals are definitely very homogenous, and our our knowledge of Neanderthals as uh, paleo as ancient Eurasians has kind of misled us because Denisovans are definitely very 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 distinct from each other, and I think part of it is the ecology of the of the of the Pacific facade of Eurasia is much more diverse and amenable uh, to human existence and human occupation than the northern fringe of Eurasia, which is where Neanderthals lived. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is. I mean, this is this is great. What, what what big questions sort of do you see still out there in sort of the uh, paleoanthropology genetic world? Yeah. Well, so as you know uh, from reading my, my recent piece, uh, there is Australian like ancestry in the people of South America, the indigenous people. Okay, I, this is now confirmed so many different ways, including from an ancient ancient skull uh in brazil ten thousand years ago to like sampling natives in the andes and the amazon and stuff like that and so these people are more closely they they have ancestry that's more closely related to people in papua new guinea and australia uh than anywhere else so you know this is a crazy result um i've talked i've heard that some archaeologists actually are, are like positing there could have been like Pacific voyagers or something like that. I think most geneticists believe that there was ancient population structure in Siberia where there was a, a population in Siberia that's part of a Eurasian lineage uh, that's that's closer to um, that, that that's closer to Australians and Papuans and that that got overwhelmed over time. Uh, some results indicate that the Jomon people of, uh, of Japan, who contribute about 10% of the ancestry of modern Japanese, actually uh, do have ancestry from a lineage that's closer to Australians and Papuans than it is to, say, Han Chinese. Uh, so I think that that's what most geneticists favor, that there's like variation in ancient Siberia that we're just not aware of and that's undersampled, and that an earlier group probably crossed uh, by beachcombing, by using like boats, uh, like boats, rafts, uh, whatever, kayak type things, um, and basically going from like inlet to inlet. And even though the coast was mostly glaciated, there might have been some areas that weren't glaciated and they could have jumped and then eventually made it to the New World more than 20,000 years ago. And these were the dominant humans in the New World for 10,000 years. And then they were quickly eliminated uh, in North America. Their population levels were really low. They didn't cause the megafauna to go extinct. They probably were mostly focused on the ocean zones, and um, they were quickly eliminated in North America or absorbed to the point where they're not detected. They were mostly absorbed in South America, like you know, there's only like one to ten percent, depending on your parameter settings. But um, they still left some of their ancestry in South America, so that's a big mystery. Um, 
like in terms of how they got here, who they are, what they're related to, all of these things. Um, there's huge mysteries about Africa in terms of the deep structure. Um, did hu- modern humans emerge as one species at the same time, or do we emerge as like separate individual species that mixed and matched constantly, just like has been happening over the last 10,000 years? I think that's a big deal. Um, I think we're still looking for the genomes of the Middle Eastern Neanderthals. We don't have any. We have a lot of Europeans and we have a lot of Mongolian Neanderthals, but we don't have the European Neanderthal genomes. We don't have, uh, this is not genetics, but this is more paleoanthropology. Uh, We don't have like a full Denisovan skull. I think Homo longi that was discovered in China in the spring, I think that's probably Denisovan, but we don't have DNA from it. So we're still like, you know, the quest for Homo Denisova is still going on because we don't have a clear identified full skeleton. Um, We have like a skull cap and that's the closest. Uh, so, so that's, that's going to be a big deal. There's obviously a lot of work on selection. Um, there's a big paper that's going to come out about natural selection about the right lab. Uh, so for example, uh, the resistance to HIV, Delta CCR5, that looks like it came out of the Indo-Europeans. Um, it looks like a bunch of things came out of the Indo-Europeans. Their change in life. HIV, you said? Uh, HIV resistance, Delta CCR5, that variant, it seems to have mutated and originated Indo-Europeans. But there wasn't HIV back then, right? No, but it has. It has all of these immunological resistances have side yeah. effects on other things. So some of some of the things that make you more susceptible to things uh, almost certainly make you resistant to other things. I right? see. So the, it was just sort of happened that people from Indo-European background uh, had a greater resistance to HIV for other reasons. Yeah, because there was something like HIV. Almost certainly. Almost certainly. uh, My bet is that it's a zoonotic zoonotic disease because they started living with their animals intensely. Ah, okay. That makes that makes sense. So, yeah. I mean, this is great. I think you know I was going to go into sort of uh, the the sort of uh, the implications for today and sort of the the GWA studies and and all that stuff and sort of the direction of evolution. But maybe we'll save that for a different time. I wanted to talk about uh, sort of your experience, your background uh, as a public intellectual, as a person in academia. Uh, where did you get your PhD? And did you obviously, you know, no, I didn't finish. I didn't finish. I was at UC Davis, oh. but I didn't finish. Okay. I'm everything yeah. but this. <laughs> so you uh, were you thinking about an academic uh, career at one point? Uh, when I first started in academia, yeah. And and what and what happened? What did something sour you on it? Uh, well, it was push and pull. The pull is I started doing a lot of consulting, and to be entirely frank, uh, uh, I was making more money than my professor. <laughs> so yeah. uh, we had a discussion about my priorities, and I also realized like academia wasn't for me because I was very politically intolerant. Obviously, I'm conservative. That's always been a problem. Uh, they don't, uh, I, uh, I make people feel unsafe, I guess. And then the other issue is I didn't think that they were actually intellectually curious about a lot of things. They were too cowed by political considerations. So what yeah. was the point? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's sort of, see, it's crazy to me because these people, I mean, what is what you're talking about? I mean, the things we've talked about in this conversation are absolutely beautiful. I mean, the fact that we can, you know, gather these clues, I mean, it's science at its best, right? We can look at language, we can look at skulls, we can look at DNA, uh, we can look at carbon dating. Um, and it's just amazing that we know anything about what was going on 10, 20, 100,000, a million, a million years ago. It's just so cool. And these people are working in universities who do this. And then down the hall, you you have somebody who says there's no such thing as gender and like they're okay with that they're okay with like that also being a professor like that's all always sort of struck me the wrong way uh that's also rubbed me the wrong way uh do you have that intuition too or am i just am i just crazy here yeah um you know i i've thought about it and talked about it i think a lot with people so part of it is there's a hardcore of of uh of uh, people in academia that are radicals, they tend to be in softer fields or, you know, like, for example, like if you're, um, like, you know, for example, like I said, human population genetics, uh, people with human population genetics have certain intuitions and they talk to each other in certain language in certain ways. But if you're a population geneticist that works on say plants, you have no human intuitions. And so you could say crazy things to people sincerely like, Oh, well, humans are actually clinal. There's no deep structure. That's because, yeah. like, the last thing that they read about human population genetics was, like, but, 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 first year I grad mean, school I mean, 20 the, years the ago. Clinal, the clinal and the populations, forget that. I mean, you're in a university, and they tell you uh, there's no men and no women, right? <laughs> it's, it's like... It's yeah, like, but, I mean, that's... it's so, so, I think most people just go along with it because, 
that all they care about is their next grant and their particular research. A minority of people actually believe it because they're not very intelligent or they're extremely motivated, uh, mostly not very intelligent. And so you have a system where uh, the so the culture in academia keeps getting crazier and crazier every year. And you know, I had a friend. Um, uh, I'm not gonna say who it is. You would recognize the name. He's he's on Twitter. He's uh, let's say he's a DC person, and he's just like, you know what? Like um, at this point, I think I'm just gonna become a creationist again. Because like science is just saying crazy things constantly, and it's just creationists are less crazy, you know. Yeah. So, and, and I, what am I going to say to him? I can't like deny it. Like denying that male and female are like natural scientific categories, which is a thing scientists are doing, uh, strikes normal people as crazy. Yeah, yeah. I like I like what Colin. Yeah, we know Colin Wright who writes these like long yeah. like the like, arch the arch binarist, <laughs> and he and he explains like as Colin says like uh. Like he literally has told me, um, yeah. So basically, I just write that boys have peepees and uh, girls have hoo ha's. Yeah, I think I was on Twitter once, and I was like, "This is ridiculous." Did like anyone like ever read an article on like uh, 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 you know scientific journal findings on sex differences and then become convinced? Like you didn't think there were boys and girls before, but then like scientific evidence convinced you. And a few people in the comments were like, "Actually, yes." And I was shocked. I was like, "Either you're completely in the cult." Right or or you don't buy it. That's the way I looked at it. But people are you know amazingly more conformist than I would have suspected. C conformist and compartmentalized too. Uh, they they will like not think about a topic if they don't have to. Yeah, and so I mean, so I guess I mean what I'm getting at is you're saying yeah these people just care about their next grant and yeah I think that's right. I think there is a selection for for cowardice, right? Because anyone who's not a coward is going to be drawn away from it or is going to be canceled or, or whatever. Um, and, you know, I, I just didn't, I didn't like the environment at all. And I thought it selected for the wrong kind of people. I mean, did, did you feel the same way about academia? Um, when, when did you finish? Uh, I got a, uh, my PhD in 2018. Uh, and then I had a fellowship uh, until 2020, but that didn't involve a lot of interaction with people. So really, like the actually, you know, even my last few years of my PhD, I wasn't on campus a lot. So last time I was seriously on a campus for like a long period of time and like interacting with other grad students was about uh, 2016 or so. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was asking because I was 2011 to 2016. And I, I, all I'll say here is that I do think that it got crazier after 2015 and progressively so every year. Like I have no idea what some of my friends are even talking about in terms of like the words they use, the concepts, the things that are having to deal with it. Like I feel like people in like 2010 were way, way more liberal in a classical sense. Um, and then in 20, 2020, they're extremely close-minded. Uh, and they're very smug and they're happy about it and happy to be that way. They don't understand how they're viewed by the rest of the world because they don't talk to the rest of the world. Um, and so that's, that's the way it is. I have a friend who was uh, did his PhD in Stanford uh, in the 2000s uh, in biology, and he came back to campus to give a talk. And he's in he's in Silicon Valley now. But um, and uh, he he asked me. He was like, you know, "This was like in 2016, 2017." He's just like, "What happened? Like everybody is they're like all communists now." And I'm like, dude, you've been away for like eight years. It's, you know, it, <laughs> it's it, this is a thing. It's yeah, it's so funny. I see these people like on Twitter, these young conservatives, Generation Z is, it's like, it's, is they're sick of the boomers and they're like right wing and sick of the BS. And there's just no indication of that. I just think we're we're in a dark place. Like, I think we're just at the tip of an iceberg. And I think the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years are just going to be really bad in this country. Uh <laughs> what, what, what do you think? What do you think about that? I mean, I don't want you to be right, but I probably think you're right. I mean, yeah, that's a, yeah. I mean, yeah, I hope you're a, wrong. I hope, but I hope I'm wrong. I guess, and I'm I'm kind of a doomer. You know, I'm not a zoomer. I'm a doomer. But um, basically, you know, what I like to, you know, the issue is like, you know, uh, the courage of men has failed, and we live in the age of wolves. You know, it's like we we live in the Kali Yuga, like the abomination. Um, you know, the, the Brahmins today are perverts engaging in perverted rituals and rites. Uh, the great inversion rules: what is beautiful is ugly. What is ugly is beautiful. What is up is down. Um, what is ma male is female. Like nothing matters, nothing happens, and the only truths you know are inverted and evil. So yeah, I'm a doomer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like about you, Razeev. I get the feeling. There's a lot I like about you. But one thing I particularly like is, you know, you pretty much, 
I never get the feeling that you're sort of uh, you're tailoring your message to any particular audience. You know, I never get I get the feeling that there is something inside of you where everyone is nodding along and saying, you know, this is you know this is true because whatever it's the thing now everyone is supposed to believe. There's just a piece of you, and you're like me that just sort of rebels against that. And of course, there was no way you would have been in academia with that kind of attitude. Yeah, I mean, I think it was more acceptable to be an oddball. And I've talked to older people, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, there was always weirdos that would say crazy things that would make people uncomfortable, but but people would just shrug at me like, that's how they are. And those people are being purged by conformists and people that are on the same party plan. Um, You know, I I do, Taylor, I'm a little bit more politic than you. Uh, I like, you know, I I do move in conservative spaces. (laughs) And so I... I do like, I'm pretty candid about being an atheist, but you know, I'm not going to like go full Richard Dawkins on people all the time. When I'm around my liberal friends, you know, I'm a little careful when I talk about things like men being stronger than women. I know that it triggers them. So, no, I'm just, <laughs> there are certain things I will compromise on, certain things I won't. Um, ultimately, at this point, I have no major issues with religion because uh, I think organized religion is way less crazy than the kind of cults that are like proliferating today. So I don't generally speak about that, but uh, you know, um, different people are different, and I will tailor a little, but uh, I will never lie, and I think that's the similarity. Like mm-hmm. you, you will never catch me misleading someone into thinking that I think something I don't think. The issue, though, is sometimes people connect the dots inappropriately, and they think that I'm saying something different, and I don't always know. You know, so a lot of my liberal followers sometimes I will say something. And they don't realize where I'm coming from. And they're like, right on, resistance mom. And I'm like, oh, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, nobody, not even me. I mean, you say you're more politic than me. I mean, not even me, not even I am unfiltered, right? I mean, everyone, to be able to participate in society, you have to, uh, you know, you have to sort of hedge a little bit or just be silent on some issues. I don't speak on every issue because there's, you know, there's an audience, there's a people who follow me, there's people who like me, and they're probably, because they're inclined to like me, they're inclined to believe that I agree with them on some issue that they think is really important that I never talk about. And unless the issue is really, really important to me, right, uh, you know, it's fine to let them think that. They're, you just you have to be a human being and you have to be able to, to fu- socialize and function uh, in this world, right? Um but there's you know there's just some things like are men and are men and women different right our, our genetics you know is 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 America a white supremacist country right is there yeah. a, does genetics have anything to do with intelligence these things are just such fundamental truth it's like to me it's like not saying the sky is blue right it's just it's just yeah. the, I, I have no tolerance for for that yeah I mean it depends on and some it depends on sometimes I will not speak because I just don't have time you know like so for example if someone's like you know because of systemic racism a lot of times I'll just be like I don't believe in that. You know, and then they'll be like shocked, you know, just remind, it'd be like, it'd be like, you know, like when I was a kid, people would be like, you know, cause, because, you know, God says, and I'm like, I don't believe in God. They'd be like, wait, what? And I'd be like, I don't, I don't believe in God, you know? And so when people say like, you know, because of white supremacy, I'm like, I don't believe in that. And they're like, wait, what? And I'm like, I don't believe, I don't, I, I don't think white people are all that. I don't think they're supreme. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then people would be like, wait, wait, I didn't say that they were supreme. I'm like, that's what you're implying. Yeah. Yeah. Today on Twitter. So then we was- have a whole different conversation. There was on Twitter today, there was some blonde woman who uh, who tried to cancel me and saying, you know, stale and male. Uh, she called me stale and pound. <laughs> She's blonde and, and I'm an Arab. And she tries to like, uh, she tries to like tag CSPI to like get me fired. I don't know if you've seen this. but it just, Wait, it just, she tried to tag the, 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 the organization that you are the head <laughs> of? Yes, the organization where, yes. <laughs> but you sh- what you should have done is emailed her like, said so it has come to our attention <laughs> that, she that i have Twitter. been very problematic so i will definitely look into this you know what Razim? It, it's not too late for me to do that this is not going to be released for you know a week or so and may, maybe i'll do that and by the time this comes out people will people will know the results well, may, maybe you should have her on the podcast to express <laughs> her concerns about you so that you can interrogate your own privilege and perhaps cancel <laughs> yourself yeah, I mean, this I mean, you can so- like you can put out a you can put out a message that um, Dick Kanania's behavior in public does not represent the values that we at CSPI hold dear. Therefore, um, we have decided to part ways with me. <laughs> and yeah, then after we'll, we'll like, in, in, in the interest of uh, rehabilitation and forgiveness, we have decided to rehire me. 
<laughs> I mean, look, we're, 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 we're like, this is like a farcical level. So one thing that I have told people is, um, you know, back in the two, in the teens, in the paleolithic of, of wokeness, uh, yeah. white women in particular would try to explain racism to me. And I would just say, well, I grew up in Eastern Oregon as a brown skinned person and I was physically attacked. So I think I have some knowledge of racism that you might not. And they would usually back off. Now they don't back off. Yeah. Now they, now they know. Now the, po- the politics has sort of, uh, you know, it's funny. I mean, it's hard to explain to young people. Like, if you said the word white like 20 years ago, you just mentioned like, oh, he's a white guy. People would just like laugh because it was like so unmarked. It would be like the only people who talked about quote unquote being white were like white supremacists or like white nationalists or something. Uh, now it's just normal, right? Now they say in the New York Times, X who is white, right? Uh, call the police on this person or or something. It's really disgusting. Um, you were you said you were you were beaten up in Eastern Oregon. So you were you grew up somewhere where there was basically nobody who nobody who quote unquote looked like you, right? That's what they say. Uh, well, so one, uh, I got into fights. Uh, I want to be clear. A lot of the uh, virgins out there think that I was bullied. I wasn't. So what I did is, if someone called me a racial slur, I would get my friends together and we would beat the living crap out of the person. Okay, <laughs> right. and so that actually, got- but you have to do that. Otherwise, the, you'll, people will pick on you. You have to fight very fast, very aggressively, and I like to like even the odds. Uh, or people will pick on you in that sort of co- uh, context if you're a minority. Um, there was uh, who looked like me. Oh yeah, there was a motel owner's kid who moved in to eleventh grade, uh, and he looked like me. He was a so there were there were um, when I lived in uh, in Union County in 1990, uh, there were no other families of Indian subcontinental origin in the county according to the census. Uh, there were some students at the local university. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so I was, yeah, so I, I mean, I grew up, yeah, in south southwest suburbs of Chicago, and I think there was a lot of Arabs, actually, uh, in the school that I went to, you know, maybe like 10% uh, or something like maybe, that. Which maybe is, by know, that, that's why, that's why you're so well adjusted, because you saw people that looked like you, and you felt like ethnically accepted. I was like the only Arab Christian, I, they were all darker than me, I was the, by far the lightest. There was another uh, Christian Arab who was also light, interestingly enough, who was also very light. Um, and then all the rest of them were dark, um, and they were all uh, Muslim. And there was, you know, we had some Mexicans. We had maybe like ten percent, five percent Mexicans. I never had a single East Asian. We had like one or two Indians. I never had an East Asian uh, in grade school or, or high school uh, or anything like that until I went to college. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was uh, it, it, like the race thing, like was a big deal. Like people called me an Arab a lot, but it was like everyone called everyone like, you know, Mexicans and, you know, we, we made fun of Italians and, and stuff like that. So it was just, it was just like completely normal to just like address someone with like a racial slur. And sometimes it was aggressive and sometimes it was not right. You would do that even with your uh, friends or we'd call, you know, po- we had Polish people, we call them, you know, Polacks. I mean, that was just, that was just completely normal. Um, and uh yeah so i get these people who say like so i can understand like you grew up in an environment like everyone says you know arab this arab that or you know if you're mexican or or whatever uh but like the idea that that would shape my politics today or like shape who i am like the fact that i was you know picked on or some things i went through as like a child or like fighting other kids that's just disgusting to me that's just so repulsive to like you know, what a thinking mature human being should be. I just never had any time for it. And I'm sort of, I'm sort of grossed out when I hear other people who, who do develop their sort of political and social identity based on that. Well, uh, maybe you should talk to Noah Smith. (laughs) (laughs) Why Noah Smith? Oh, I think he's talked about being bullied. uh, What was was he bullied for? uh, Eh, You know, just being a Jewish nerd, I think. So, you know, uh, okay. you know, some people talk about things like that and how that like shaped their kind of view of America and other Americans. And, you know, I mean, my issue with, uh, so I guess like, you know, like keeping it real, the fundamental problem that I have with a lot of white people is I actually, th- I mean, like not that many people listen to your podcast, right? Like, like uh, I actually well, think we're, I'm kind we're of, getting, we're getting up there. I mean, we're, okay, we're well, let's just say that I don't think that I'm inferior to them on the contrary. Let's put it that way. So I don't get this idea of like, you know, when people would be like, how does it feel that everybody around you looks totally different than you? And I, you know, I just be honest, I'd be like, I don't know. I like literally never thought of that. That's just not (laughs) the the big difference between me and you is not what I look like. Trust me. 
Yeah, you know, well, it looks. I mean, looks are important, especially for I think women. For it's like it's like a different thing, but it's funny the MacArthur the MacArthur Genius Grants. If you look at them, uh, they just came out the, a day or two ago, and there's 25 of them, and there are like eight people, seven or eight, I don't know, who look like white men, and then you look at their surnames, and like six of them are uh, like five or six of them are Hispanic. Right. So they like they met some diversity quota, but they just gave it to these, you know, these super privileged white men because they have Hispanic surname. They went straight to the front of the line and they're all doing something on immigration or almost every single one. Right. It's like, mm-hmm. a, you know, a filmmaker who's going to the border or something like that. And there's like out of the 25, there's like two, uh, you know, there's like they, there's like two, uh, ab- I said, able bodied, uh, non-Hispanic white males. There's a blind white male. <laughs> so I said able bodied. Wait, wait, so Trevor Bedford is one of them, right? I mean, Trevor's legit. Uh, Trevor Bedford. Yes. Yes. He's one of them. Yeah. But there's only two. Right. He must have. Oh, been. and Jesse he, Shapiro. He, yeah. Shapiro too. Yeah. So and he, I they know overcame. Jesse. I don't know him well, but I've emailed with him. Yeah, yeah, no, nothing against. It. I mean, those guys overcame some massive affirmative action. Obviously, they were the old. They got the white male. Slot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like so, yeah, they so got to be like basically like if I didn't know, and I do know know something about them. If I didn't know anything about them, I'm like, damn, these guys got to be like this, like legit geniuses. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I they, like so. they, like I'm sure it was like white male. Uh, okay, you know what though? But they're just so genius. You know? <laughs> yeah well they, yeah they, they had they, i think they had a quota probably like okay two three and so they're doing like serious stuff and then like a lot of them are just like you know poet and interpretive dancer right? and, you know like that's a you know that's a genius grant ibram kendi uh i got it too but yeah it's funny because even the look it, by the looks like me test right those hispanic men are like not adding to diversity right by yeah the, i mean just look I, at the surname I, thing i got are. a serious i got a i got some beef with uh white hispanics because you know, like sometimes they'll be like, you know, because we're brown people. And I'm just like, dude, you're looking at me yeah. with your blue eyes. You know, <laughs> right. like I'm a legit brown person. Like I don't like I didn't like change my last name to like have an easy or whatever the hell magically became brown. Like my butt's brown. You know what I'm saying? So just like don't overstep. Like I understand in our society, despite the fact that you're probably 100% Castilian, you are the Brown underrepresented minority and I'm white adjacent. I understand those are the rules, but like, don't actually like talk to my face as if like, we don't both know what's going on here. Yeah. You know, it's funny because the way the government classification system works is like, so yeah, Arabs. So we would always take tests, right? And like the all question always came up because, you know, we had a significant uh, uh, population of Arabs in my school. Like when we take the standardized test or whatever, like what should we check? And they just like had a rule. They would sit there and they'd say, okay, Arabs are Caucasian. And then like people internalize that because when people would say something like, oh, uh, you know, like, like, I don't know, we were just some, somebody in like a high school or something was discussing like, you know, different, uh, you know, uh, disease risk by race or population. And then somebody said, well, what about Arabs? And someone said, no, no, Arabs are, are Caucasians. People had taken the government classification, right, as a, um, as sort of a scientific truth, right? And so like yeah. Arabs were sort of white to them, right? So, so, the, so there is no like, they didn't give any awards to Arabs in the MacArthur Foundation just because the government census, uh, you know, the people who were designing the census, the uh, uh, the, the federal uh, government bureaucrats back during the Nixon administration decided Hispanics were their own thing and Arabs were not, and that that that, that shaped the entire culture, right? And, and and that's crazy. You're a person who looks at genetics and history and language, and to you, right, the idea of the average person is just going off of government forms and builds their identity based on that seems sort of ridiculous but yeah. that is actually i think how a lot of people think it is and that that is why like some geneticists do the thing where actually like race is a social construct because the census categories are kind of ridiculous you know like they're they're ex- they're explicitly using the census categories as a way to debunk race yeah yeah right anyways so this is this is this has been fun Razib. um any uh, so I asked Steven Pinker this. So you've been through academia, you've been in consulting, you've been in the corporate corporate world. Uh, you have a Substack. Any advice? I get I get emails all the time from young people who are in college or people who are thinking about going to grad school or at that certain point of their lives. Um, any advice you give them? If let's say they read you and they read me and they're they're intellectually curious and they're thinking what to do with their life, but but they want to do something uh, intellectual or be in the world of ideas, what, what would you tell them? I I think your goals are super important. Um, uh, you know, what are your goals? So if you wanna, if you wanna spend your life uh, analyzing Shakespeare and that's all you want to do, uh, okay. Uh, and you can be totally apolitical, then do it. Um, it's just a job, and you can just like shut people out, not deal with them. 
um, or just like jump through the hoops. Like, I mean, there are people like that's the thing for them. Um, so, you know, one problem I have with grad school is like I am intellectually uh, broad. I'm interested in a lot of things, and that always right. causes problems. Uh, if I had just focused on the domestication of the donkey and be stayed an evolutionary gen- genomicist, and that's all I did, and kind of faded out from the public realm, that would have been fine. Uh, obviously, I have a problem. I can't do that, even though it causes problems in my career uh, in terms of people like reading my Wikipedia entry and uh, asking me about that during investment pitches. You know, uh, if, if you're like me, just understand you got to go with the punches. Uh, you have to expect the unexpected and just be true to yourself because that's who you are. But if you're able to kind of conform um, then, you know, uh, that's what most people do. And, you know, you shouldn't be ashamed of it. You're just, you know, you're not going to be a player, but you don't want to be a player. You want to study what little topic you want to study, and that's it. But if you want to be broad and go from thing to thing and explore, like, the world as it is and maybe ruffle some feathers, then, again, you better expect uh, that they're going to come for you because they will. Yeah, so I think if you have any, I think what you're saying is if you have any sort of breadth of interest or you have any desire to be in any way public or political or even like if you don't if you're if you can't even be i mean i would i would take it a step further even if you can't just nod along during like ridiculous you know training sessions or struggle sessions in these universities it might not be for you i mean i think it's getting harder and harder to sort of compartmentalize to be the guy who just analyzes shakespeare and then just has a normal life right because the more and more like you have to submit a diversity statement in a lot of places you have to actively sort of affirm the creed so yeah i mean if, if if you have any Go well, ahead. I mean, if you're a white male, uh, you have to agree that Paris is worth the mass. Uh, there's there's no way that I think you can actually be heterodox uh, if you're a white male. You have to armor yourself with the true faith. That's the only thing that can protect you. Uh, yeah. If you're a minority of some sort, like if you're a black woman, lesbian, I think there is a possibility that you will be allowed to be a heretic in some way. And a yeah. deviation is action is massive, by the way. If you're a black lesbian woman, I mean your your job prospects are, are much, much better in the first place. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, you know, we all we, we probably both know. I mean, there's a lot of white males that have had problems. There have been there have been hiring uh basically like there have been multiple like research one universities that have like departments that I know in science and biology that have gone on hiring binges, but they were explicitly looking for uh, underrepresented minorities, and they just shut it down where they didn't find appropriate candidates. And they're just—they're not going to hire white men. Period. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, if they're a public university, they can't explicitly say it, but th- you know, uh, it sounds like it sounds like you're, it sounds like the more we talk about it, the more your advice is don't go attack it. <laughs> it seems like there's a very uh, like a, for a, for a white man with any politically dissenting views, it seems like well, at least in America, it's it's, tough, uh, it's it's not as bad in Europe. It's not as bad in Europe or Australia. Um, it, 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 I mean, what happens in America spreads, but it's not as bad in Europe, Australia, or Asia, right? And, yeah. you know, we both know people that are going to move to China. You know, Shenzhen's doing a cluster hire. Uh, this is a thing. It's happening. Yeah, that's fun. Well, hopefully, hopefully they, um, they don't become like us, you know, in, in the process. That's, that's always the danger. Uh, so, yeah, this, this was fun, Razib. Thanks, thanks a lot for joining us. All right. Take it easy, man.